Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second Graduate Research Day, which is now officially an annual event. Um, my name is Lenny Brown, and I'm Associate Dean of Research and Graduate Studies in the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences. Uh, I want to start today's event with the land acknowledgement, even though we are meeting virtually. Hopefully, the virtual format will change next year, and we'll meet face to face. Um, so, uh, to start the meeting, I want to acknowledge that I want to acknowledge the land that connects us. The University of Guelph resides on the treaty land and territory of the Mississauga of the Credit and. We recognize that today this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. And acknowledging them reminds us of our collective responsibility to the land where we learn and work. Uh, so the purpose of today's meeting is to showcase research done by graduate students in our college and you will hear many exciting presentations of the cutting edge research which is done in collaboration with faculty, staff, undergraduate students, doctoral fellows, and of course industrial and uh, governmental partners. So this, this is a great opportunity for us to make new connections between units in the college, between colleges, and uh, between uh, uh, graduate students. Uh, it is also a great opportunity to provide people with uh, a chance to improve their presentation skills, to learn about new research. Um, and um, general, uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, it's a great opportunity for everyone to connect and to learn a few new things. Um, so, um, the, the agenda for today's uh, meeting, for today's event, is very straightforward. After this introduction, we will start uh, graduate student presentations. They will be done in a 3MT format. Uh, for those who are not familiar with this format, uh, this is um, a single slide presentation limited to three minutes. Uh, and um, this actually reminds me to encourage everybody to participate in 3MT competition next year. We have annual 3MT competitions, which are very exciting. And this is a good chance to uh, prepare for uh, this upcoming competition. Uh, next, we will have a short break after the competition um, around 10.30, 10.45. We will reconvene at 10.45. Um, and um, uh, we will hear a very interesting panel. Uh, uh, Professor Don Gillis from Sox will preside over this panel. He, and the topic for the panel is emerging from COVID, innovative thinking sparked by COVID-19. Um, uh, during this time, uh, the judges will work on uh, judging the presentations, and after the panel is finished, we will announce the winners and present awards for um, best presentations, uh, and uh, we will adjourn after that. Um, so, um, I want to remind the, uh, all the participants that um, uh, they can use Q&A feature on top of your screen. You should have a couple of balloons with question marks. Uh, this is where Q&A uh, resides. Um, so, um, with that, I want to pass the range to Carrie Ann McCougan, uh, who will uh, preside over the presentation. And uh, thank you again um, uh, for all our presenters, visitors, partners, 
panelists and of course organizers. Thank you. Enjoy the event. Thanks very much, Leonid. So we will uh, get started with our presentations um, now. Um, so our first presenter, if you could just turn on your your video. I'll get it queued up here. OK, so the first presentation is um, by Iman Agarwal, and it is called the is called Illuminating the Pair Instability Supernova Mass Gap. So I'll just get your slide up. And you can go ahead when you're ready. Recently, uh, gravitational wave observatories observed black holes in a mass range where theoretically no black holes should be present. This mass range is called the pair instability supernova mass gap, and it lies roughly between 40 to 160 times the sun's mass. A star, when it is in this mass range and about to collapse to a black hole, a nuclear runaway process will cause it to explode or shed some mass. So the question is, how did the gravitational wave observatories observe these black holes? Hi, I'm Aman and I'll be seeking an answer to this question in my research. Let's start with the big star on the left. There's a subclass of massive stars called collapsars, which are massive, rapidly rotating stars about the mass 30 times or more to that of the sun. These stars are so massive that they do not undergo a supernova but collapse directly into a black hole. The collapse process is shown in the middle where you can imagine the star to have these onion like concentric layers. The first few layers would collapse directly into a small nascent black hole, but the corresponding layers have enough angular momentum due to the rapid rotation to form a disk around the star. There will be turbulence in this disk which will drive some mass away from the system. This is the collapsar model. How is this related to the pair instability black holes that I was talking about in the first? We propose that let's take a collapsar which lies above the mass gap, 170 times the solar mass, for example. This collapsar, since it's above the mass gap, won't undergo supernova, collapse directly into this black hole accretion disk system, and we find that the, it will eject mass of the order of 50 to 60 solar masses and the remaining system will come down to 110, 120 solar mass size. The remaining system, eventually the remaining disk would be eaten up by the black hole and you'll have a black hole of the size of 110, 120 solar mass sitting comfortably in the mass gap. Not only this, this ejected mass is a luminous event. If you see the bottom right uh, plot, you can see the colored lines is the luminosity of this ejected mass, which is called the super kilonova compared to the gray lines, the standard supernova curves. Hence, these events will be luminous enough to be observed by the upcoming telescopes like Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope and the Vera Rubin Observatory. These disks also would be massive enough to emit gravitational radiation or the ripples in spacetime as we know of it, which can also be targeted by the upcoming space and ground wave, ground based uh, gravitational wave detectors. The amount of nuclear physics, gravitational physics and astrophysical information available in these systems is enormous and we can't wait for the day these systems light up in our detectors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aman. So we will uh, take a small uh, pause here while our judges uh, deliver or write their notes. So we'll just give it a moment. OK, so if our next presenter could please Put on their video. Perfect. So our next uh, presenter is Abdullah Al Hayali, and the title of his talk is "Semi Supervised Algorithm for Segmentation of Neonatal Cerebral Ventricles from 3D Ultrasound Images." So I'll put your slide up, and you can go ahead. Okay. So. Picture this, you're playing your favorite contact sport. It's your unlucky day because you got tackled hard and your knee is in mangles. 
you go to the hospital to get an EMRI scan and after an hour of scanning, the verdict isn't given and you're set in limbo whether you're good to perform your sport or not. Now, let's up the stakes a thousand notches as we now need to accurately and quickly scan for brain bleeds in low weight infants, aka neonates. Brain bleeds are rather a common pathology in neonates and its consequences could be high, blood, uh, high pressure applied onto the brain due to ventricular expansion shown in the first row of images, um, seizures and potentially fatalities. Current methods require displacing the fragile neonates from the incubators they're in onto MRI machines to perform scans that are usually 15 minutes long and that poses risks to the physical state of the infant due to the displacement. This research project uses 3D ultrasound images due to their low picture acquisition time and the ability to scan without displacing the infant. The goal of this project is to use a novel machine learning technique called semi-supervised learning, where a very small sample of images, is, uh, which is well annotated, is used to teach the algorithm to detect brain bleeds, and the accuracy of the detection is increased significantly by a larger set of unlabeled images. The unlabeled images teach the algorithm features that could be relevant to the, um, to the current label scans. And they are also helpful because they are available in abundance um, and they are not expensive to produce. And no expert annotation, which is expensive, is required. The biggest hurdle faced, uh, we're facing um, in this research is the low quality of the 3D ultrasound images. However, the pros outweigh the cons. The implementation of this algorithm extracts valuable anatomical information, such as the size of the bleed, and is up to 540 times faster, um, i.e. from 45 minutes to five seconds in detecting the ventricles in, in a scan. The accuracy of the detection improved from 72%, which is the state of the art results, to 74% in our model, and it's still in its early development. Um, and that's the reason why the metric improvement is not as significant, but the goal is to improve it to a point where human intervention won't be necessary. The successful implementation of this project will require far less expert annotation, time and cost, and will assist healthcare workers in detecting and understanding brain bleeds in infants early. It could also assist in selection of um, treatment processes uh, due to the understanding of the bleed, and lastly, could potentially catch cases far early before they worsen. Thank you. Thanks very much. So I'll just leave your slide up for now um, while our judges uh, jot down their notes. OK, so our next presenter is Rohini Gaikar, and the next talk is called Will AI Replace Radiologists? So I'll just cue to your slide and go ahead. Thank you, Kirian. Um, hi. So you might have uh, noticed that uh, your near or dear ones are suffering from uh, pain and they are not getting appointments for the imaging scans. This is the situation. There are a number of uh, reasons for that. And one reason is that the flow is manual workflow. What is manual workflow? The radiologist took the scan, they discussed with it, and then it, they come up with the report. This report can be based on their discussions, but without any artificial intelligence or any other uh, software technique. Now, what is the reason for this delay? The delay is because of the imaging scans are so critical, it's very difficult to analyze them. So this manual workflow can be replaced by artificial intelligence powered workflow where deep learning models will give, uh, give analysis of each and every image. These voluminous uh, imaging scans can be analyzed for different uh, problems. Here you can see that the renal mass detection problem statement, how it is processed with the deep learning study. Here in the top right, you can see that the renals are, this is called organ segmentation. This The flow is followed just like how radiologists uh, go with their manual methods. So this is manual seg organ segmentation where they will go with localizing the uh, mass or the uh, renal uh, kidneys there present in the 
uh, abdominal images. Once the segmentation is available, they, then they will focus with the abnormality, how uh, it is there, where it is located. After abnormality detection, there comes the abnormality classification, whether they are benign masses or they are malignant tumors. This classification will decide what method of uh, medical treatment should be followed and the other scans will tell uh, that how the uh, how the patient is treating or behaving with the medical treatment. So this is the prognostic study where you can take the follow up. Once this medical treatment is going on, then with all those medical biomarkers and the parameters, radiologist can determine what is the survival prediction of the patient. So this is followed. This deep learning method, the AI powered workflow will follow how the radiologist follows in real life. Now, why AI? Because it will not go in manual analysis. It will be a very accurate and precise knowledge about what is the problem present in the uh, or the patient is suffering. The other thing is that this will when manual segmentation is there, it will take average 30 minutes to scan one 3D image. But in this case, the less than five seconds, the manual scan will be available. So that's why the AI powered workflow will be a precise segmentation, precise knowledge of abnormality, whether malignant or benign. And at the same time, this treatment surely will replace biopsies, which currently followed for the uh, for the cancerous treatments. Thank you. Thanks very much. So I'll leave your slide up there for a moment and let our judges uh, take down some notes. OK, so um, our next presenter, if you could just turn on your video. Perfect. OK, so our next presenter is Nikan Momenbetolahi. And uh, the talk is called Entrapping Gold Nanoparticles in Membranes for Enhanced Fluorescence Detection of Proteins. So I will just hand over control to you. Just one moment and change the slide and you can go ahead. Uh, proteins are fundamental components of cells. Um, if we can quantify them under different uh, pathological conditions, we can gain insight into human health. However, in order to use them as biomarkers, we need very sensitive methods because they can be present in very low concentrations in the blood, and the current methods lack the sensitivity. For example, with the current gold standard, which is ELISA, a tumor can grow for 10 years before it can be detected. So the goal here was to use a combination of 3D membranes and metal enhanced fluorescence using gold nanoparticles to improve sensitivity in protein detection. So here we can see this oh, here. Um, here we can see this phenomenon uh, showing a 3D membrane containing the um, antibodies used as well as the blocking agents and the gold nanoparticles on a 3D membrane for the detection of immunoglobulin G or IgG. So in order to do this, um, the first to capture antibodies or go anti IgG were spotted on a nitrocellulose membrane, followed by rinsing and blocking steps. Um, then the um, analyte, which was the rabbit anti goat IgG, was added. And after final washing steps, um, gold nanoparticles were added for signal enhancement. So in order to determine this approach, um, as shown here, we compared the fluorescence for the application of physically absorbing the um, antibodies on gold or applying gold first, then the assay first, or applying assay first, then the gold, and we compared that to a control on a 3D membrane, which had no gold, and a control on a 2D polystyrene surface with no gold, which is the current gold standard. So it was shown that the assay first and the gold showed the best fluorescence by a factor of two, and was shown as the um, approach. Uh, then we compared different sizes and concentrations of gold nanoparticles for optimization, keeping a five-fold dilution factor. So here the different colors show the different sizes of 5, 20, and 100 nanometers of gold nanoparticles, and the concentrations go higher as the colors get darker. So the 5 nanometer gold nanoparticles um, at a concentration of 1.3 times 10 to the 11 particles per milliliter showed the highest fluorescence signal uh, with a two-fold improvement factor. Um, on the membrane with no gold and an 18-fold over the um, 2D surface with no gold. Uh, 
So then we were able to apply this to uh, human plasma and a detection limit of 28.8 nanograms per milliliter was found for IgG, which was a thousand times lower than that of 2D assays and 50 times lower than that of 3D assays. And we can see our method scatter plot in blue and the control is in red. So we also compa compared a different membrane, which was cellulose and a different fluorophore, which was dialyte 633 um, to optimize the method. And we still found the previously described method worked the best. So to conclude, using gold nanoparticles in 3D membrane can be an effective, easy, and transferable method of improving uh, assay sensitivity and uh, potential future enhancements could include multiplexing. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Nikan. So I'll leave your, your slide up there um, while our judges uh, take, a, take a look and write down their notes. Okay, so I know our next presenter is trying to join the call, um, but hopefully he'll be able to get on soon. In the meantime, then if you're ready, I will uh, queue you up. Um, and so are, are you all good to go? Uh, yes, I'm ready. Okay, perfect. So the next talk is uh, going to be given by Lin Yi Tang and it's called Cold Plasma Treatment to Reduce Mold and Aflatoxin from Peanuts. So I'll get your, uh, your slide up in a moment. Okay, you can go ahead. Hello everyone, I'm Lin Yi Tang. Today I'm gonna talk about cold plasma treatment to reduce mold and aflatoxin from peanuts. Aflatoxins are naturally occurring toxins produced by aspergillus species mold. The management of, of aflatoxins poses a significant economic burden, causing estimated 25% or more of the world's food crops to be destroyed annually. Mold growth and the formation of aflatoxin can occur pre-harvest, harvesting, and post-harvest crop seeds, such as peanuts. Aspergillus flavus can contaminate food or crops then consumed by humans or animals. Furthermore, it can cause acute aflatoxicosis, liver cancer, growth failure in children, or immune suppression. Aflatoxin is chemically stable and can survive traditional food processing. Among all the types of aflatoxin, aflatoxin B1 is the most toxic. Hence, Novel technology such as cold plasma is needed to reduce aspergillus flavor mold and aflatoxin from peanuts. What is plasma? Plasma is the fourth state of matter generated by adding energy to your gas. Cold plasma is an ionized gas that contains uh, bactericidal and fungicidal molecules such as ozone, hydrogen, peroxide, and reactive gas species. My current research is applying high voltage atmospheric cold plasma to treat moldy peanuts to inactivate mold and degrade toxin. For first, I put peanut samples into a plastic box, then fill the box with uh, different humidity of air and uh, seal the box with plastic bag. Then the sample box will be applied to high voltage electric field which will take the O2 into water vapors from the air and then gener generate the reactive uh, molecules to attack the mold and toxin structure. My, uh, my overall goal is to uh, use cold plasma technology to reduce at least 99% of the mold and 70% of the toxin without affecting the quality of the peanuts. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lin Yi. So I'll leave your slide up there and we'll give our judges a moment. Okay, so I'll ask our next presenter to put their thing on, perfect. All right, so our next pre presenter is Babak Tavana and the talk is called Biosensors in Clinical Trials. So I'll just change the slide and you can go ahead. Thank you. As you know, it's more than two years that all the board has been involved with coronavirus. Did you ever ask yourself how the governments approve or disapprove 
the new medication or vaccine? Or why the um, process of the vaccine development is taking a long time? Technically, um, new drugs and medication, or of course, vaccine should be first um, test in clinical trials in four phases. These four phases are very complicated. First, sponsor um, ask patients and volunteers to take the medication, then draw the blood, separate the uh, plasma from whole blood, send it to lab, and in labs they have to again, <coughs> again, uh, defreeze the plasma um, and extract the main analyte inside the plasma and send it to complicate chromatographic systems and then report the data. Is it complicated? And of course, costly. Instead, in my research, we are going to design new electrochemical biosensors. These biosensors are designed for clinical trials. With the electrochemical method, we are going to design the um, biosensors, including the microfluidic system and the body of the main sensors. We just need a few drops of the blood. After putting the blood on the chip with the microfluidic system, we can separate the plasma right away. And immediately with the body of the biosensor that was exactly and specifically designed for the analyte, we can detect and measure the main analyte. The electrochemical methods such as MIP, such as antidotes, and um, other uh, methods can help us to design the bio, uh, biosensors. After detecting uh, the measure and change voltage, convert to the concentration and report. Can you imagine, instead of the very complicated and costly uh, process, we design a easier, faster, much cheaper, and more reliable system and bio sensors um, for clinical trials that can help us to save, of course, more than 40% in price and time. Thank you for your attention. My name is Boba Tivana, and if you have any additional questions, just let me know. Have a good day. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, so I'll just leave the slide up there for a moment and we'll take a small pause here. Okay, so I'm just, our next presenter, we're gonna go back a bit in this agenda. So um, if you could put your video on. Perfect. Okay, so we have Surendroy Singh Singham, um, and the talk is called Biodegradable and Antimicrobial Filter for Respirator Mask. So I'll just get you set up here. Hello. Uh, Hi. Can, you, can, you, can you hear me, Kerry? Yes, we can hear you. So you can go ahead um, whenever you're ready. Great. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, first, let me ask you two simple questions. How many face masks have you used so far and where did you dispose them? Number two, how confident and comfortable are you in wearing your face mask to protect against the COVID-19? I'm pretty sure that you don't have an answer for this, right? Yes, yes, I understand everyone is frustrated and tired of COVID-19. What if I tell you, I'm going to give you some good news today. But first, let's take a short journey to better understand the conventional face masks we are wearing today. The currently available face masks are generally developed from polypropylene and polystyrene polymers. These materials could take up to 500 years to decompose in the natural environment. This mask, on the other hand, had problems such as breeding difficulty, low filtration efficiency, and most importantly, they cannot inactivate the pathogenic microbes accumulated on the mask. So how can we reduce the environmental impact and the functional shortcomings of this mask? My PhD research will solve these problems. To do so, I have developed a filter for respirator mask 
which has both antimicrobial and biodegradable properties. This could be a game changing technology, believe me. This mask has two major components, an active and a passive component. The passive component is the supporting body of the mask developed entirely of cellulose fibers extracted from plant biomass, whereas the active component is a filter developed through electro spinning technology from biodegradable polymer such as polylactic acid. Electro spinning is a technique that uses high voltage electric force to produce nano size fibers. My fibers are 20 to 50 times smaller than those fibers used in conventional surgical masks. This filters, on the other hand, has high breathability and filtration efficiency due to its smaller pore size and larger surface area. Scientific studies have shown that silver nanoparticles can kill pathogenic respiratory microbes, such as coronavirus. To make my mask antimicrobial, I incorporated these silver nanoparticles into the fibers during the electro spinning process. These silver nanoparticles, when in contact with the pathogenic microbes, disrupt their cell membrane and kill the microbes. At the same time, this mass after their disposal will biodegrade in the natural environment and then we have an eco-friendly and a safer mass. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll just leave the slide up for a moment while our judges jot down some notes. OK, so. I'll just move forward in the slide deck here. Um, so is our next presenter ready? Mehdi, are you there? Yes, I am. OK, perfect. So I'll just get you set up here. So the next talk is being given by Mehdi Esmaili, and it's called Reactions Driven by Light and Controlled Within Peptides, A Path Toward Greater Efficiency. So I'll just hand over, I'll cue your slide and I'll hand over control to you. Thank you. OK, you can go ahead. Thank you. OK, imagine you could cook your food without using any kitchenware and without producing any waste. Designed for energy efficiency, and preventing waste chemicals are the two principles of green chemistry. Talking about waste chemicals, in Canada alone, more than 1.3 billion tons of waste is generated every year. The question is, what's our plan to deal with this environmental concern? My PhD research focuses on methods that can control the productivity of molecules in the solid state. An approach toward manipulating molecules in the solid state is to engineer their crystal structures. Over the past couple of years, we've created a decent technique that can bring us closer to discovering different factors that impact on reactivity of molecules in the solid state. In this method, we use peptides that are the building block of proteins. Shown in my slide, the two boxes compare the reactivity of the same molecule in two different pathways. The top scheme represents that. Out of several produce products here, only a fraction of that is considered as the desired main product, and the rest is only base chemical. So the reactivity or the productivity of this specific molecule is only 42%. In contrast, in our proposed method, for the same molecule, when it is incorporated into peptide structures, the productivity would be greatly increased to about 95%. These type of reactions are driven by the energy of light, so we don't need to have very special heating regime. Peptides have very specific directional and adjustable crystal structure. With nano-sized cavities, you can manipulate different type of molecules to settle inside those cavities. The incorporated molecules tend to rearrange in different fashion, and new molecular arrangements means new chemical properties. Our results indicate that with different type of peptides, we can either accelerate or decelerate reactions, or even prevent molecules against the light, pre preserve them against the light. 
So this peptide can work as glassware that hold molecule or as modifier that facilitate reactions. So this method is a new generation of chemistry without waste and um, reactions with greater productivity. Obviously, this method would, would be based on green chemistry that improves life. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. So I'll leave your slide up for a moment while our judges jot down their notes. OK, so our next presenter, if you could just put on your camera. Perfect. So our next presenter is Ginny Galpin, and the talk is called Simultaneous Determination of Acid Dissociation Constants and Reaction Enthalpies in light and heavy water using isothermal titration calorimetry. So I will queue up your slide. And you can go ahead when you're ready. Am I able to use the pointer? Yes, I'll give you control right, right now. OK, go ahead. Perfect, thanks. So over 60% of Ontario's energy comes from what's called nuclear fission energy, and this is generated in can-do nuclear reactors. Can-do reactors use heavy water, shown here, as a neutron moderator and as a coolant, and since these reactors often operate, operate under extreme conditions of 300 degrees Celsius and 20 megapascals, their lifetime is often dictated by the corrosion products that form in the heavy water. So understanding the chemistry of species in heavy water, particularly their equilibrium constants under these reactor conditions, is important to the industry. Heavy water has two deuterium atoms bonded to oxygen, and since deuterium is a proton and a neutron, it is twice as heavy as hydrogen, which is why D2O is called heavy water. Equilibrium constants for species like acids and metal oxides are different in heavy water than in light water. But since heavy water is quite expensive and high temperature experiments require really specialized equipment, it's preferable to conduct low volume room temperature experiments and extrapolate to high temperature to, de to determine these equilibrium constants. One way to do this is by determining the equilibrium constants and reaction enthalpies at room temperature and to use a Van Hoff relationship to estimate high temperature equilibrium constants. The deuterium isotope effect on the pKa and on the reaction enthalpy is the difference between these values in light and heavy water. So my project uses a sensitive isothermal titration calorimeter where a change in heat is measured over the course of a titration experiment. From one ITC curve, such as the protonation of bicarbonate shown up here, the equilibrium constant and reaction enthalpy can be determined. This can be done in both light and heavy water using a very small volume of one milliliter of sample, and we can determine the deuterium isotope effect shown here. The deuterium isotope effect can be quite small, such as 0.25 for the delta pKa, hence the need for a sensitive instrument like an ITC. Then these values can be used to estimate high temperature deuterium isotope effects. These can be checked, the, val the validity of these estimates can be checked with a computational study. I use a computational model where the, where the charged species is placed inside of a polarizable continuum with the same properties as the solvent and at the desired temperature. These, uh, these species can be, the electronic energies can be calculated to yield the equilibrium constants and reaction enthalpies. So using calorimetry and computational models, I can use a very tiny amount of heavy water and very mild conditions to predict the chemistry in heavy water in a nuclear reactor. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. So I'll just put your slide up for the time being. Give the judges a moment. Okay, so if our next presenter is ready, perfect. OK, so our uh, next presenter is Samantha Binkley, and the talk is called Ionization Constants of Secondary Coolant pH Control Amines. So I will get your slide queued up. OK, and you can go ahead when you're ready. Thank you. 
All right, good morning. Uh, so my work focuses on the secondary system of a candy reactor, which you can see highlighted in blue on the top left hand corner of the screen. Heat generated from the fission reactions of uranium in the moderator is transferred to the secondary system in the steam generator where it produces steam. This steam is then used to turn the turbines, which generate electricity for all of us, and then it is condensed and run through the system again. The fluid in the secondary steam system can be thought of a lot like a really hot bowl of soup, except that instead of carrots and celery and chicken, which I think make a really good soup, we have things like pH control additives, oxygen scavengers, corrosion products, and even some contaminants that find their way into the system. Currently, many of Ontario's reactors are undergoing refurbishment processes, which are meant to extend the lifetime of our reactors for several more years. As part of this refurbishment, the industry is interested in optimizing the chemistry control systems of their reactors. Currently, ammonia is used as a pH control additive in the secondary steam system. And although ammonia has worked very well for many, many years, it's actually so volatile that it concentrates in the steam phase, leaving the condensed phases of the steam uh, secondary steam system unprotected. And so as a result, the, is in, the industry is interested in several alkanolamine alternatives for pH control, one being 3-methoxypropylamine. In my research, I measure heat capacities all the way to 120 degrees Celsius. And as you can see in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, the extended Van Hoff equation, um, we can actually use these heat capacities to determine the temperature dependence of our ionization constants. Ionization constants are great to help determine the viability of a new additive as a pH control agent. Using these heat capacities that I measure and some really cool math tricks, I'm able to obtain the parameters for the uh, ionization constant predictive equation that we've been able to develop. And so as you can see in the bottom figure, the solid black line is the predictive ionization constants I've been able to, cal been able to calculate, excuse me. You can see that with all the literature data, we have very good agreement within air all the way to 250 degrees Celsius, which gives us a very successful model. Ultimately, we'd like to apply this method to several other alkanolamines that may be used as pH control alternatives and inevitably use this data to model how well they will work with all of the other components of that big soup fluid of the secondary uh, control system and ultimately use these in a Kanji reactor as an alternative optimal pH control additive. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. So we'll get your slide up and give it a couple minutes. Okay. So if our next presenter is ready, get you to turn your camera on. Perfect. Okay, so the next presenter is Sonu Sharma, and the talk is called Distillers Solubles from Ontario Corn Ethanol Industries as a novel bioresource of proteins and anti-DPP4 peptides. So I'll just send it live to your slide. And if you're ready, you can go ahead. Oh, I'll just unmute you. You can unmute your microphone. Oh, Sonia, can you unmute your microphone? There we go. Hello. Perfect. OK, you can go ahead. OK, just a second. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, I'm presenting on uh, the topic value addition to corn byproduct. So as you know, like uh, creation of the byproducts and waste materials creates a lot of environmental pollution and problems to the climate change. So my research focuses on how to reduce the, the negative factors for environmental pollution. So coming to the introduction, corn is the third highest grown crop in Canada. Ontario is the largest corn grown uh, province in Canada, which is contributing around 63%. The majorly corn is disposed in three forms, animal feed around 45%, 18% for human food, and the most important 37% for ethanol and other industrial purposes. During the ethanol production, several low value corn byproducts are generated, which are not fully explored. 
Now, as shown in the figure, a cone bioethanol plant situated in Ontario, in which the bioethanol is a main product, <clears throat> while distiller soluble is a byproduct. This byproduct uh, currently is used as a animal feed purposes, and this material is a very complex material considering its uh, other components. Uh, and the amount of this material is generated uh, uh, as a huge that is around 15,000 metric ton per per year. So uh, uh, this material contains around 18% uh, protein content. So I designed a novel green extraction process which provided a protein concentrate of around 65% protein content. Furthermore, I used a proteolysis approach which uh, through which I found and I developed a protein hydrolyzate with 89% protein content in which the anti-DPP4 peptides were identified and characterized. So DPP4 is an enzyme which causes diabetes in human beings. So um, overall, I developed the two value added products in, uh, which can add a high value to this byproduct, uh, uh, to this low value byproduct in which uh, 4000 metric ton of uh, protein concentrate and 1500 metric ton of protein hydrolyzate can be uh, developed uh, annually. So the potential expected benefits could be protein high concentrate is a high value ingredient for development of various plant based materials. Protein hydrolyzate can be used for nutraceutical or pharmaceutical industries. Both the value added products can be very highly beneficial for the farmers and the developed products can be an economic game changer for the bioethanol industries throughout the Canada and across the world. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So I'll leave your slide up there for a moment. OK. So we have one final presentation um, for this morning, and uh, I'll just uh if our presenters here if you could put on your video perfect um so it's called uh it's our presenter is mohammed reza mohage apologies um and the uh talk is called effect of geometric configurations on the thermal performance of encapsulated pcms so i will queue up your slide and you can go ahead when you're ready. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, what are the most important concerns uh, in our world nowadays? Uh, energy and uh, global warming are definitely two of them. So uh, a projection shows uh, the consumption of renewable energy is uh, has the fastest growth uh, compared to other type of energies because they are clean uh, sustainable and free. Also, they can address uh, global warming issue and also greenhouse uh, greenhouse emission issues as well. <clears throat> One of the challenges to uh, utilizing uh, renewable energy, specifically uh, solar energy, is uh, storing them. Phase change material, uh, as known known as PCM, uh, is uh, a material with an inherent intelligence to store and release energy, thermal energy, just by changing the phase uh, from solid to liquid and vice versa. For example, in a uh, in a in the in the day during the day, this material can absorb the energy of solar of uh, sun uh, as a thermal energy and store it and release it during the night uh, to our targeted system. For example, our house. So uh, to prevent the leakage problem as uh, well as uh, uh, chemical reaction of PCM with other uh, part of our system, encapsulation is uh, proposed. Uh, encapsulation means cover PCM by a shell uh, uh, cover. So uh, there are a few uh, methods to enhance uh, the performance of the system. Uh, uh, for this kind of uh, storage systems, we realized uh, that the shape of the system can really affect the performance. So in this research, uh, we are going, uh, we we aim to uh, 
uh, optimize, uh, we aim to increase the performance of the system by uh, shape optimization of the capsule. Uh, in this regard, uh, we uh, simulated uh, uh, some, we, we modeled some numerical simulation and uh, proposed a, a novel geometry. And also for validation, we run a set of experimental. The results shows that uh, the performance of the system uh, significantly increased uh, just by an effective geometric design um, from 12% uh, to 50% compared to other convectional capsule shapes. Next step is optimization by using uh, machine learning tools uh, for heat exchanger devices. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, so I will, as I did with everyone, leave your slide up for a moment for our judges. Um, but that was our last presentation for this morning. And so we'll have a little bit uh, longer of a break than anticipated. So the panel will start at 10.45 a.m. So everyone can go ahead and take a break from the screen, uh, go for a walk, squeeze in some work, um, and we'll reconvene here at 10.45 for our panel, um, which I'm very excited about. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the Q&A um, and we will be happy to answer those questions. So, and big thank you to all of our presenters um, for sharing their amazing research. Um, it's not an easy format to do a three minute talk, so um, I'm extremely impressed with everyone. So thanks so much. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this panel discussion on uh, emerging from COVID, innovative thinking sparked by COVID-19. Uh, my name is Dan Gillis. I'm an associate professor in the School of Computer Science, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Um, I'm quite looking forward to this panel because uh, uh, often uh, as academics, we don't always get to sit down and talk to one another necessarily about the research that everyone's doing. So I, I have a feeling I'm going to learn a lot uh, from this conversation, um, and I hope I hope you find it valuable as well. The uh, <coughs> the uh, panel that we're going to be uh, chatting about today really the focus is on the role of researchers and industry partners, um, and that role that they played in navigating the the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, so most of you are probably aware of this, but over the last you know, 18 months of the pandemic, researchers and industry partners from the U of Guelph, um, particularly within the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences, they've uh, stepped up their response to COVID-19 because, you know, we, we need everybody's brain sort of on this particular uh, situation. Um, and so what we're going to talk about today is how some of the researchers and industry partners have pivoted, how they've taken the challenge and, you know, adjusted the work that they were doing, come up with new novel ideas uh, in order to address the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to start off with a few introductions um, and then we're going to get into questions. I want to get right into that. I don't want to spend too much time uh, telling you the logistics of everything. Um, but uh, the one thing to be aware of uh, for those of you who might have questions, um, you can submit them into the chat in Teams Live. Um, and if time permits, after uh, a certain set of questions have been uh, sort of reviewed, then we'll we'll get to those audience questions um, and uh, hopefully address your your needs. Okay. Um, okay. So in terms of our panel, um, there are four panelists. Um, we have Dr. Monica Karjiko, <laughs> sorry, Dr. Monica Kojikaru from the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. Dr. Rosita Dara from the School of Computer Science, uh, Dr. Ed McBain from the School of Engineering, and Nicole McClellan, who I believe, I didn't have this in the notes, so Nicole, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you are doing your PhD in the School of Environmental Sciences, I believe? That's correct, at Guelph, Excellent. yes. Wonderful. <laughs> um, so just to give you sort of a brief overview of what everybody sort of is involved in before we dive into the questions. Uh, Dr. Monica uh, Kojikaru, conducts research that un furthers our understanding of the mathematical theory involved in time evolution of equilibrium problems. 
Um, she's also uh, examining applications to and the modeling of population health, particularly as it pertains to uh, human behavior, uh, looking at vaccinations, uh, infectious disease spread, um, and adopting of new norms, which we've all been uh, you know, dealing with over the last 18 months with COVID and the various restrictions we've had. Um, in one of her recent studies, she found that uh, randomly testing students for COVID-19 could help control outbreaks. Dr. Rosita Dara from the School of Computer Science explores big data analytics, data mining, and data governance um, with a focus on applications such as privacy, um, enhancing technology, social intelligence, and precision agriculture. And I'm looking forward to some of her responses in relation to uh, the impacts, uh, particularly looking at data and uh, uh, the use of social media and such uh, later in the, in the panel. Uh, research teams that are led by Dr. Dara have worked uh, at leverage, leveraging social media to help build earning early warning systems um, for future outbreaks of COVID-19 and uh, presumably for application to other potential uh, diseases. Uh, Dr. Ed McBain from the School of Engineering, uh, his research is primarily focused on examining the vulnerability of water supply security. Um, he relies on statistical interpretation of data, AI modeling, bait and transport of chemicals and pathogens in the environment, and risk assessment and management to determine how water security risks may arise. Um, and his work recently includes uh, examining climate change as applied to water resources phenomena, and in particular, more recently, uh, using uh, AI in modeling the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, wastewater capturing of uh, uh, COVID. And last but definitely not least is Nicole McClellan. Um, uh, she is a process specialist with over 13 years of experience related to public health protection through water treatment in government, academic research, and consulting industries. Um, her area of expertise comprised drinking water treatment, regulatory development and compliance, process performance demonstrations, and management of contaminants of emerging concern, such as disinfection byproducts, algal, blo algal blooms, uh, and novel pathogens. Um, she received her BSc in Honors Biology and MASc in Civil Engineering from the University of Waterloo, and is currently pursuing her PhD uh, to improve the detection of waterborne pathogens and better inform risk assessments for water management decision making. Um, I'm really interested in listening to uh, the answers to some of the questions we're going to have uh, presented today, uh, mainly because I know that the work that everybody uh, is going to be talking about today isn't uh, an individual thing. It's it's a team-based approach, and a lot of this requires the uh, expertise and energy of grad students. And so, I'm really looking forward to see uh, to hearing how that all plays into the the pivoting from what they were originally doing to what COVID-19 has now sort of led them to. Um, but enough of that. Let's get into the actual questions. <laughs> so. We're going to start off with a conversation specifically about pivoting research because as we know COVID has impacted everything that we do and many of us have had to uh, reimagine what we were doing or reapply what we were doing to the, the COVID pan pandemic. So I'm going to start, uh, this will be a roundtable uh, question. I'm going to uh, start with Ed um, and basically move through the, the panelists. Uh, we'll try to spend about 10 minutes on this, um, but the the First question I have for you, Ed, is um, in terms of pivoting, how did COVID-19 actually affect the research that you were doing? Um, yeah. Oh, Ed, I believe you're on mute. I, yeah, I just, yeah, sorry, I just had to <laughs> unmute myself. Um, no, very good question, and thanks, Dan, for the introduction, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, hopefully, this will be informative. You might wonder why a guy who is a security concerns with water really got involved in this. But what happened in part was I was in India at the time of the outbreak and could sense, oh, this is not going to be good at all. I returned there from there, obviously, uh, rather quickly. Um, and from there, identified the NSERC um, COVID program that they had available. and. Because I've applied AI in a number of different areas and they are quite widely disparate, I recognized oh, very quickly that, hey, this has really got a whole bunch of attributes which influence the potential for people to become ill and die and so on. So the AI was an obvious candidate, but um, 
you know, as a result of all of this, I prepared a proposal to NSERC and it was subsequently funded. Uh, being a bit of a glutton for punishment, I also knew an awful lot about long-term care because I'm from British Columbia and if you recall the outbreaks in Canada were really severe in Vancouver area, the greater Vancouver area, and I thought okay disinfection is really an important criteria there because whatever the pathways are that people can be exposed to, that's going to be important. So I wrote that proposal and then Again, I deal a lot with wastewater and we know that feces of infected people show up with the virus in them. Hence, and this is the key and one of my recurring themes and whatever I say today is going to be associated with the people like I have expertise in some aspects, but what I needed was a group of people that would be able to assist in all of those. So I've worked with some very fine people and uh, one of them is uh, Nicole who will be talking later. She's with Stantec, so that's an expertise in terms of wastewater. Uh, in terms of AI, work, I worked with Andrew Gadsden in uh, mechanical engineering, and we also brought on board a, a high-powered firm from Toronto who deals with AI in applications. And so, uh, you know, that and people like uh, Larry Goodrich from food science and uh, Mark Abash from environmental science, etc. What we did was collectively get a team, wrote the proposal, etc., submitted it, and then thought, oh, these are all going to be funded as we soon found out. So then I was obviously scrambling to find the right people. And I, just as an example, but you might keep this in mind just because it's, I think it's relevant. One of my PhD students has been doing AI applied to water distribution pipe breakage. Well, what breaks a pipe is a function of how old is it, what kind of soil conditions is it, how, you know, how thick is the wall and so on, the pressure surges, etc. So I said, well, rather than be a TA for the next term, why don't you work on this and I'll pay you like a TA to help me control it. And then I hired four undergrad students and so on and, and the rest is history. So I think one of the most important things I can really emphasize to the people presumably who are grad students is um, find out what you need to know, gather together and know the expertise of other people so that you can assemble the proposal quickly and submit it. And, you know, obviously writing, etc., is very, very important. Um, but, you know, reacting quickly, providing what's needed, gee, that really works and it's been fascinating and challenging. But uh, I'll leave it at that for now and uh, come back later. Excellent, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I would agree. Like the, the especially with the the pandemic, like it's it's basically required all of us to quickly adapt and such. But the the working with others and bringing in the expertise from other disciplines and such has been, I think, a huge uh, a huge benefit of what's come out of the pandemic. And hopefully, more and more of that continues in the future. Um, let's move on to uh, Monica. Uh, same question. How did COVID-19 affect your research? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for organizing this. Um, so for, for me, it wasn't so much of a big, it's not, it wasn't a big pivot. <laughs> it was a bit, a bit smaller pivot. Um, so, so of course, as, um, as we are all so, so, so aware and probably sick by it, sick of it by now, you know, we're all very familiar with these um, models, right? The, the SIR, SCIR, all these <laughs> population type models that a lot of people, of course, in the mathematical biology uh, use a lot and not only there. And so um, I dabbled before in, in some health related, you know, population health models, but it was, uh, it's not my main area of, of research. Um, my, so, um, but I mean, it was such a big psychological and and sort of um, emotional impact, at least in the uh, within my team at the time, that um, essentially all of my trainees were, were um, PhD student, uh, three master students, two postdocs. <laughs> uh, they all just basically did not want to work on <laughs> on other things, and so so they ended up actually. Uh, concentrating to, uh, on their efforts um, in this direction. So what we were really sort of interested in 
in a bunch of things along the way in the last year and a half. But um, if we were really interested early on in, in testing and, and uh, how testing um, as a policy can be used not just reactively, but preventively, hopefully. Um, so we looked into that and then, of course, we got into other investigations. Um, so in terms of research, it was not such a big jump for me, but it definitely became overwhelming over the last year because it kind of took over <laughs> from a lot of my other uh, interests. So then we've, we've uh, I've been a member of the Fields Institute Modeling Task Force, COVID Task Force since its inception. That was early April 2020. And we're keep keeping going there. Um, and so the Fields Institute now has um, been successfully uh, funding, uh, has received funded a uh, funding for a program called Mathematics for Public Health, which is really driven by the work in the in the, in the modeling task force. Um, then the modeling task force work was directly feeding into the Ontario Science Table. And as you know, from there, it would sort of eventually um, go up the chain to 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 policy decision makers. Um, so that was a very interesting experience, you know, talking about your, your you know, your overarching um, need of collaborators and outside uh, experts. Um, so on the other hand, we I was, you know, uh, I'm fortunate uh, in a sense because I'm I'm um, married to someone who works uh, <laughs> for a living for do, does research um, in population modeling and data analysis um, in industry and so, uh, with Sanofi Pasteur Global. So through that, I just, you know, I'm much, I guess I'm more aware of, <laughs> of, of, uh, of the industry angle of, of these questions. And so, uh, so that was said that was an easier partnership in a sense. And there were a lot of people, of course, having interest there. So the partnership moved on. And then, of course, there are some colleagues at York University and most recently now some colleagues in Newfoundland and Atlantic Canada. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I'm looking forward to expand on that whenever we have time or if there are questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, your, your comment on the uh, sort of the emotional side of things, we don't often hear that in research and I think we should. Um, yes. Uh, the pandemic has been, uh, it's affected all of us in, in a variety of ways. And I know from the work that I do, uh, there, there's definitely an emotional connection to it. Uh, you can't really eliminate it as much as we want to as scientists at times, but uh, so thank that you. Is true. Um, okay, so let's move on to Rosita. How did COVID-19 affect your research or your industry collaborations or any of that sort of thing? Okay. Thank you very much, Dan, um, and thank you very much for uh, organizing this event uh, and inviting me. Um, so uh, basically, I have been working with a group of colleagues at University of Guelph, uh, both at Ontario Veterinary College, on um, using different data sources to for early detection of avian influenza, but mostly focus on animals. Uh, for that project, we uh, basically built decision support system, which means we took data, collected data from different sources, including social media, weather, uh, wild bird, um, uh, migration path, um, disease information, uh, severity, and anything that gets reported, and a few other data, FAO, for example, trade data, the farm density, and those sorts of things. Um, we created a database, we, um, you know, data schema, and we were able to show that you can predict uh, a disease in a region, uh, an outbreak uh, in farms in a region. But also we were able, a separate paper that we published, that even with using social media, which at that time was only Twitter, we were able to show that um, you can uh, predict, uh, you can, it's, it would be a weak indicator, but Twitter can be used to predict avian influenza in a region between uh, two weeks to three days in advance um, because of the discussion, probably farmer organizations or uh, I, I assume farmers, they don't tweet a lot, but, but uh, we were able to, be, to detect it. So for avian influenza, uh, we collected data for a year and a half and, you know, we, we were able to show these results. As soon as the co uh, COVID happened, we decided to bring a kind of a similar idea to COVID as well. Uh, we started collecting um, Twitter data and this time we've also looked at Google um, 
score data as well. You know, the Google search result, uh, all of our data gets collected and it's tagged with location, which is city and, and uh, it's not county city or province or those sort of information. Um, and then we also started looking, we got too excited and we started looking for other sources of data. So we looked at, can we collect, for example, airplane um, kind of schedule data or uh, traffic between cities data. So for, I think for airway uh, traffic data, it was around $60,000. For uh, it, that took us months to find uh, to who can we, uh, we can speak with. For traffic, there was somebody claimed that they can give us traffic in Ontario for ten thousand dollars. I'm not sure how. Uh, we weren't sure even where they get the data from, and we didn't have the money to be honest with you. So we dropped all those ideas, and we ended up with having basically cases that government was reporting on daily basis, as well as social media data because it was very easy to collect. So by that time, it passed a few, uh, I guess, months, and I asked my um, graduate student at that time, who is now my postdoc, and I said, how many tweets we have collected? And we tried to keep it very generic, uh, COVID-19, coronavirus, you know, kind of. Um, and then she said there are 9 million tweets. <laughs> so uh, we, we assume there will be lots of noisy tweets in there. So we started from scratch. We said, let's start looking at um, control measures and how people discuss control measures or symptoms. So our first paper that we published, we showed that the first wave, even in um, uh, Canada, we were able to predict it in Ontario with two weeks in advance, um, sorry, three, few days in advance, not two weeks, from the time they, uh, I think that there's a buzz started and, uh, you know, before lockdown and all of that, it was sometime in January we were able to predict. And the uh, first wave was much easier to predict in certain regions. Obviously, some we looked at many parts of the world. Uh, in US, people use tweets a lot. So Twitter was a good indicator of that, uh, of the, for, the, for predicting uh, an early, I mean, as an early predictor kind of tool. Um, then a second wave, it became slightly harder and uh, we call, they call it kind of uh, uh, pandemic fatigue. People don't tweet it anymore. But uh, the, uh, as you can imagine, Google tend to be shown to be the most accurate predictor because we tend to kind of consult Dr. Google occasionally to about our disease. Um, so basically, social media has shown to be quite impactful uh, in terms of being able to predict that something is happening in a region based on the discussion. We have later extended it to other applications such as, you know, foodborne illness outbreak and still the results are co quite consistent. Uh, we later expanded our um, analysis to, for example, uh, sentiment analysis, understanding what people say about vaccine and those sorts of things. So it uh, all of a sudden became an, an interesting area of research for me, which was slightly uh, I was working on. But then what if we look at demographic of people who are tweeting, look at the dif difference between f male and female now. So then we, we continue working on that area. Um, we are constantly working on that area still. So um, yeah, so that's how it came about. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the Twitter stuff is pretty, I, I find it super interesting because uh, I mean, I'm on Twitter, so <laughs> I, I love the idea of uh, using that kind of data to actually being able to model uh, outbreaks and such. So it's very cool to me. Um, OK, and, and Nicole, how about you? How did COVID-19 affect, um, I mean, you're a PhD, doing your PhD, so how did it affect your research and also your your day to day job at Stantec? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, frankly, in terms of my personal research, I was on a parental leave when uh, the pandemic started, so um, it was kind of nice. My husband was also at home, so he could uh, watch the kids and I could um, try to focus on working from home with all the chaos. Ironically, they're home today with a uh, cough. It's waiting on three days now, COVID results. <laughs> so it's a little bit chaos here, so I apologize if we get interrupted. Um, in terms of my work at Stantec, you know, it's a large consulting firm. We have 22,000 staff and offices worldwide. Um, and we, um, I was just checking, I think it was um, February 2nd, 2020, I received an email from one of our client managers in Asia, from our Asia office in China, and they were curious about um, any risk to their wastewater treatment operators from exposure to uh, this virus 
in their you know occupational work and so I did what we do when, when a client calls we respond and um, you know that kind of drives our research focus so we you know dug into the literature and looked at you know what information do we have about you know the inactivation of these types of viruses in wastewater effluent and potential human health risk from that exposure so we were able to use quite a bit of data from surrogates for these viruses that had been done at bench scale testing you know looking at the efficacy of chlorination for the inactivation of these viruses how persistent are they in these um, environments in this water matrix um, and we also had some information from research that was done following the previous SARS pandemic on SARS-CoV-1. And we felt confident to say, you know, based on the structure that we know of this virus, probably um, the information would be comparable. And so we summarized that information for them and felt that, you know, it may be worthwhile to share this literature summary with um, Canadian and American uh, partners as well, so that if it came here, we, they would be prepared for any kind of media questions that they might have, you know, can the virus then, you know, be in the wastewater effluent, make its way into source water for drinking water, can it enter the drinking water system? And uh, so we did release what we call a white paper, an internal research paper. And then we were asked by the Ontario Waterworks Association to uh, give a presentation to all of their operators on the information that we found so that they would feel more confident going to work and what sort of PPE they should have in place. And we had 500 attendees for that webinar. And so now they use this video to educate their operators as part of their training. Um, so we felt like that was how we were able to respond and support the industry that we serve. Excellent, thank you. OK, so um... I, we spent a little bit longer on that sort of uh, the pivoting research section than, than I originally planned, but that's okay because I really wanted to get a sense of how everybody has, how they've adjusted their life in reality to the, the pandemic. Um, so I'm gonna uh, maybe do a little bit of a lightning round <laughs> to make sure that we can get through some of the, the, the list of questions that we've got here. Um, I'll start with Monica. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the research that you're doing with COVID-19 testing and in schools? What inspired that specific research um, and what are some of the results so far? We had a bit of a teaser earlier in the uh, in your introduction, but I'm just uh, curious to know a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. Uh, so we, we started with a larger question. So uh, way back when uh, we were, I think, in May and amidst uh, the, the middle of the first wave, so to speak, uh, we were all at home. Um, uh, a, a, a collaborator of, of mine uh, from some time ago in Sanofi and somebody actually in California who is, uh, became a collaborator but actually works um, as a software developer, uh, works at Airbnb, actually is one of the founders of Airbnb. <laughs> uh, he was very, very um, sort of interested in finding out the answer to one very simple question that we thought, you know, simple, <laughs> uh, which is, um, can repeated testing uh, help control some of the some of the spread and thus maybe allow us to not be in lockdown, but rather, you know, be under NPI restrictions, but not such a strict lockdown as you remember California was in lockdown a lot longer than we were and so we started investigating that and we're looking we looked at, a, at the regions or country levels and we have results for that so we've been able to use some SCIR estimates and really math really cool math uh, not hard to hard to do and we we got to an estimate of, a, of a, like what is the frequency of testing right it would need it at a country level and a country level depending on the country and how bad we were at that time for Canada was somewhere around five every five days if we test everyone every five days so roughly once a week for the for California it was a bit higher because their numbers were higher so anyway so we got those results so we got very excited but then and over the summer of course we went through first wave we all at least in Ontario we kind of felt the relaxed <laughs> but then then we realized well hold on the schools are going to start so what are we going to do? So so then the Ontario Science Table actually was really interested about mid-July uh, on the question from the ministry coming down on the question of how do we deal with schools? 
how, what policies should we put in schools and what should how should we use testing it was one of the questions. So so myself and some and a group of colleagues at York um, were kind of started working on this uh, first in parallel then together and I was working from a theoretical point of view and they were working from an agent based simulation point of view so they actually simulated an entire school. So we were trying to figure out you know how frequently should we test in every class a student in every class and um, we actually come down both from theoretical and simulated side to a magic number of about testing three students in a class of 25 on average per day. So then you would rotate, right? Then you would rotate this. So, so every day would be tested about two and a half times a month. But then if we take into consideration the fact that the ministry, of course, implemented the masks mandate and the cohorting, so the kids were not allowed to interact with other classrooms, that actually was better because it actually came down to testing one child every day. So then you would rotate the class, right? And every 25 or however many kids in class you have, you would test the one child. And then you tr you trace, obviously, if the test would be positive. And other colleagues at Queens were proposing a uh, pool testing. So so take take multiple samples from a class, but just test once, test the group sample, you pool the samples. And that's, e that's cheaper in a sense, right? From the test perspectives, because that was a consideration of the ministry. Um, so you could do it that way. So I know we all, all of these ideas were presented to the Ontario Science Table, and there was a lot of push to implement. <laughs> As you know, that hasn't been implemented, <laughs> but what has been implemented was a blitz testing strategy instead of last December, where, where they would go in a particular neighborhood and say, you know, around the school, let's test everyone this weekend and trying to figure out. So it was not, ide not ideal, but it was more than zero. So <laughs> I guess this is how things sort of go up and then, then trickle down as policy to us. Um, but yeah, so and mostly we're all, of course, all my colleagues were interested in school testing because we all have kids. <laughs> so, <laughs> so from a parent perspective, there was a direct impact. Yeah, I, I imagine the work that you're doing there uh, obviously is having, uh, you know, parents, uh, as you said, who have kids like the mental health benefits of that research, knowing that this is, uh, yes. you know, all that we need to do is test a few students. I, I mean, that that the, the amount of reassurance that that provides is, yeah. is substantial. So that's yeah. really, really cool. Yeah, um, we got you. we got a lot of uh, excellent reviews also in the press and people at large, and I even got to expand on these ideas with our MPP, with our Ontario MPP member uh, representative. So we've excellent. done all we could. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Um, OK, so let's uh, I'm going to uh, move on to Rosita and ask you a little bit more about the the work that you've been doing using social media, because uh, as I said, I'm a Twitter fan, so I'm quite interested. Um, could you uh, describe a little bit more about how the system works? Like, is there sentiment analysis included in it? Um, what what's happening in the sort of the background? And uh, and then sort of in addition to that, what impact do you think that this could have on future disease outbreaks? Because you know, with uh, climate change and, and whatnot, there, there's uh, expectations that we're going to see more pandemics, uh, more outbreaks of different viruses, novel viruses uh, coming down the pipeline. Um, so what do you think this, the research you're doing could do in terms of uh, managing that sort of uh, situation? Sure, thank you very much. Uh, so very quickly how it works. So depending on the objective that we have for uh, using the, uh, this data, uh, obviously we took a different approach. For example, if our objective was to predict, we, as you know, there is a lot of noise in Twitter data. It could be misinformation or it could be any other information. It could be joke, political joke or those sorts of things. For prediction for a certain region, what we had to do, we had to collect obviously data and we had to pay to get the region information as much as possible because Twitter doesn't make that available for free. Um, so we paid for the data. So, uh, but we had to first get rid of irrelevant data. So we used, uh, we had the student who annotated around in one case 4,000 in a new, another case 10,000 tweets based on our objective, relevant or irrelevant. We fed that into AI algorithm to make sure that the accuracy was over 80%. And then 
basically, when the actual tweet, how many million data that we collected, or a thousand, depending on our objective, that classifier was able to tell us, as we assumed the accuracy was at as much as 80%, get the data that's relevant, then we use that relevant data for prediction of uh, whether, you know, uh, whether we could before um, uh, an outbreak wa was announced in, a, in an area or, or report went up, we were looking at the trend to show that the Twitter was able to show the trend much earlier. A few days, a few weeks, uh, a few weeks is too much. I guess it's the maximum. It went up to two weeks. Um, so, uh, so that was one approach we did. Then the sentiment analysis was slightly different because we wanted to understand what people are saying about a certain topic. So we use sentiment uh, analysis methods, for example, in, a, in one of the recent uh, research uh, uh, kind of uh, paper that we are working on, we are looking at the ability of an AI classifier to distinguish between misinformation and just uh, kind of, uh, you know, just detect misinformation and put it aside. So that was really sentiment analysis. Again, there are algorithms that are already embedded into Python that you can use to do sentiment analysis. Or again, we assigned another student who kind of annotated 10,000 tweets and uh, to misinformation and just regular. And then we fed it to the AI and we were able to increase it. Obviously, in the amount of misinformation that was regarding uh, related to vaccination. Um, the misinformation was less, so we had to extract more added to the to our corpus, so that uh, with up to 85% accuracy, we can distinguish misinformation from uh, actual uh, kind of uh, truth and uh, you know ground truth the way we. Uh, Kind of annotated it. So, um, uh, so again, there are other sentiment uh, algorithms that are included in Python. You can look at positive and negative tweets. So, all of those can be done. Um, uh, so, it really goes back to the basically or your objective. Then, how you manipulate data depends on the objective. Then, you can use text mining methods to clean up data and get uh, raw vectors or you can use deep learning so that it doesn't need that much of a pre-processing. And it, again, it depends on the objective. In terms of the impact that it has, you can look at it in two ways. We have shown that it is effective in uh, to help us understand something is going on in a region that could be uh, abnormal. So that, that can be uh, used for that purpose. We have also in a recent paper showed that um, uh, public health can use this information to control misinformation and communi uh, communicate kind of positive information about control measures, uh, about, you know, uh, control misinformation, to, uh, feed positive information or correct information to the public. Because uh, in one of our research, which was also confirmed by, by Carnegie Mellon University, many of the anti um, sources that were posting anti vaccine posts were bots that probably an agency or a group activist or, or the, the, that they have created. Um, so uh, until those bots were shut down, you know, there was a period that they were able to, you know, kind of send information and, and that has impact on people's decision whether they want to take a vaccine or how they view public health effort uh, in terms of controlling vaccination. So I think it's absolutely criteria for public health to start building tools that they can at least monitor what's going on on social media and to try to be to have a presence there and also communicate the right information uh, as uh, you know the, the younger generation will be using Twitter more social media more so that, that's the way they get their information so it's absolutely absolutely critical for the government for public health and for everybody to use it what is the right way uh, of doing it? This is this requires a lot of uh, discussion. What's the ethical way of doing it? Do uh, do we want public health to create bots as well to just communicate the information, or does it, do we want human to sit in the back, uh, you know, back end and tweet? So those are the decisions that, as a society, we have to make, and also with the government. Uh, but the, the, what uh, social media offers, the, we haven't even had a chance to look at news. We collected it, but it was enormous amount of data, news feeds, all of those, all the text that gets generated can tell a lot about what's going on in society. So the use of social media is absolutely critical, in my opinion. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I would agree with you that it's it's absolutely critical in, in doing some of the monitoring and whatnot, but also from the point of view of the information that we're providing to individuals through social media, 
Um, there, there definitely needs to be some more work there. And there, there is a PhD student in OVC that's currently working on looking at the best practices and how to improve uh, response, uh, uptake of information uh, from public health because it's 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 not as engaging necessarily as what you know other people uh, the misinformation folks are writing because <laughs> they, they have more opportunity to to write um, than the public health folks do at this point. Um, Thank you. Cool. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on to Ed because um, I'm just trying to keep a track of time here, and I do want to get to a section where we talk about. Uh, um, grad students. Um, so I'm sure the grad students who are here are going to be very interested in that section. Um, but Ed, uh, could you tell us briefly, um, you've been involved in a bunch of different research initi initiatives associated with COVID-19. Um, can you give us sort of like a high level, what are some of these different projects that you're working on and, and how did you get involved in so many different projects? Oh, good question. Uh, the first thing I'd like to just clarify, though, is Monica referred at the outset to how life changed and everything, and I agree 100%. The last two years have been the longest decade of my life. <laughs> the The other dimension of it was I also referred to the team that we put together because the writing, the, the delivery of the product as a proposal is so key. And I think this is worth mentioning in terms of Carrie Ann, who is the organizer of this seminar uh, magnificent writer and you know helped to craft these things together so you know you have expertise anybody has expertise but it making sure that you got the collaborative spirit the all of the inputs needed to actually become successful the answer to your question i mean i could go on for quite a while so i won't do that but um Probably the biggest outcome from this, we've been involved in wastewater based epidemiology for you know quite a while. And you may think about it, but in terms of polio, salmonella, hepatitis A, rotavirus and so on, and now illicit drugs on a frequent basis. So the wastewater component is is an absolutely fascinating opportunity to understand what the heck people are doing. We've developed, and again, I'm trying to be quick, but we've developed some interesting uh, passive samplers, which is much better than uh, grab samples or auto samplers, etc. The passive samplers are easily deployed, easily recovered, and fairly simple to, well, not, not inexpensive, but regardless. Um, that's where I see a huge opportunity. And, you know, I, I'm not a lab person. I can collect really good data. Uh, in terms of things and in reference to earlier comments uh, about the size of the data, I now have 14 million uh, data sets from Ontario in terms of what's happening. So being able to analyze that data with the high tech capabilities that we've got now in terms of AI and other dimensions of it, the epidemiologic models, um, we can see the, and specifically they asked me now to look at uh, the transmissibility of the of the virus, you know, various Delta variants, that type of thing. So there's lots of opportunity and wastewater based epidemiology is only just starting in terms of importance. We were gonna, we're gonna see it in a lot of different situations. Clearly I've mentioned a few, but uh, lots more. So maybe I'll leave it up at that. Excellent, <clears throat> thank you. Um, yeah, uh, the the wastewater um, sampling and stuff. It, it reminds me of you know when I first heard back when I was doing my PhD about syndromic surveillance, and that to me was super fascinating. And this is like another uh, just another tool that I think is uh, critical in terms of uh, managing not just outbreaks but uh, various other things that end up in our water and what that might mean for the public health in the grand scheme of things. Um, okay, so let's move on to Nicole. Um, so could you, Nicole, could you tell us a little bit more about your role at Stantec and specifically like how did you get into the industry? Why are you like, why do you stay there? What What is it about the work that you're doing that is, um, you know, inspiring to you? Um, and, and particularly as you've shifted into the work as it relates to COVID-19. Sure. sure. Um, my role at Stantec is currently a treatment process specialist. Um, so mainly I manage projects and provide solutions to drinking water and wastewater utilities to optimize process performance. So for example, if a utility suspects that their filtration or disinfection system is underperforming, um, could be in terms of compliance, 
uh, with water quality regulations could be in terms of water or energy use. You know, many of our utilities have greenhouse gas targets that they're trying to meet and they see an opportunity in our industry to do that. Um, so we would lead those investigations. Additionally, I'm a coach and a liaison for our internal and external water research collaborations. So we have um, an internal research fund that staff can apply to. And, you know, if they see an innovation opportunity with a client, then they can present that to the company and we can put together a research plan, sometimes in collaboration with an academic partner. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, a, a staff member wants, we call it, give me a day grant. So you just want a day to go and investigate something, um, a new solution. That's usually where we start. Um, and then we have grants up to 150,000 internally that staff can take advantage of if they want to try to offer you know, a new service through the company. So I help them put together their research plan, present it to the, the panel that we have internally who would approve those um, and get those going and keep those on track. Um, I guess I got my start in the industry. I feel like I'm trying to follow <laughs> your question here. Um, I began working as a microbiologist in a research lab at the University of Waterloo and um, Simultaneously, I was volunteering in South America and West Africa doing capacity building. So I was helping communities gain access to education, medical care, um, water supply. <laughs> and I saw the need there, you know, and the impact that safe water could offer these communities um, and how that could help elevate, you know, their quality of life basically, and then gain access to, um, you know, additional resources. So. Um, later, I saw that, you know, there's many opportunities to solve similar problems here at home. And that's what I like to do. I like to solve problems and I feel like the consulting industry lets me do that. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, like I said, most of our interests are driven by our clients. So that that's what keeps it interesting is the solutions that we provide are very practical. Um, one of the situations we had come up during the pandemic was a lot of our utilities had a shift in water demand away from industrial or commercial uses like restaurants, for example, you know, they weren't washing all those dishes, <laughs> that kind of thing. And so we saw more water demand in the residential areas and we had some issues, you might say, more aesthetic, not necessarily health impact issues. Um, but as you increase the flow rate in the pipes, you know, in a residential system, you might start to see, for example, red water quality events, um, that kind of thing. And so we helped utilities, you know, maintain um, good water age in the distribution system with respect to this change in demand. And it was just really interesting to see, you know, we could see people were getting up later in the day <laughs> as they were working from home and flushing the toilet a little later in the morning than they would normally do um, on a regular work day. So, you know, the industry had to respond to that and it's not something that we normally have to do. Normally we know, you know, if there's going to be a big Olympic hockey game uh, or something of that nature, we try to prepare utilities for that. And this is similar to that. So, so we're putting together research now to help um, clients, you know, with respect to the fact that we may have further lockdowns in the future and how they can maintain water quality in the distribution system. Excellent. Honestly, I, I never thought about the sort of, uh, I, I don't know what the proper word is, but like the, the the human behavior associated with water and how that even has changed under COVID. Um, and even that information being available to other researchers so that they know when to potentially sample if they're doing water sampling. That's, I honestly had never thought of that. That's kind of really cool. It's so. a very thankless industry. <laughs> we just I expect to turn on the tap and it's there. So we do yeah. our best. Exactly. It's it's a much like public health. When things are working, nobody notices. It's when it doesn't work that people notice, right? So yeah, I can see that being a thankless, thankless job at times. But thank you for the job you're doing. <laughs> um, okay. So what we're going to do now is uh, because I want to keep tra trying to keep track of the time here. I want to move into uh, having a conversation about advice for graduate students. Um, so I'd like to just go around uh, the table and get um, your sort of uh, comments to the following question. Um, what's one piece of practical advice that you would be able to give an early career researcher or entrepreneur that's starting out? What has helped to get you where you are? And what advice would you have for others who want to set off in a similar direction? So I'll start uh, this round with uh, Monica. 
Um, yeah, hi <laughs> again. Um, so I guess I'm just going to put my cap, my original cap on, which is optimization <laughs> so, <laughs> and game theory, which is what what I what I mostly do. So I uh, I think that the most valuable advice I think I, I and I give all my trainees and whoever wants to listen um, is um, don't just have a plan A and B, have many letters plans. Um, <laughs> because in life you have to you have to be able to build a strategy for yourself. This includes career. This includes career and 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 uh, personal life, family life, and so on. Um, it's very easy, of course, for for us emotionally to be very say uh, hopeful and linked to a specific. Uh, path that we think we most like and most desire. Uh, so that usually falls under path A. <laughs> um, but but so um, and of course, as we as we are uh, a bit younger in our lives in and more energetic, um, we also tend to think that things will turn out good. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, but sometimes life throws us all sorts of uh, interesting complications. Uh, the pandemic being the latest ginormously scaled example for all of us. Um, and and I think I think uh, uh, a lot of our younger trainees and people listening um, should be aware to, to always plan uh, plan backups. So if you, for instance, if you are really, really, really uh, in love with being an academic, that that is your career path. That is fantastic, and please stay in love with that. Uh, at the same time, I I would um, I advise all my students uh, because of the field we're in, which is mathematics uh, and applied mathematics. Because, as you know, the the job market for academic jobs in mathematics is not particularly wide. Um, I often uh, advise them to be as interdisciplinary as they can in their training, to be absolutely aware that the new generation that they live in uh, look, looks nothing like Generation X where I belong, <laughs> um, and um, maybe somewhat like millennials, but maybe not as much. Um, they grow up with a lot more varied information channels and the type, the way they get information to Rosita's point is very different from, from where we're coming from. And they have to navigate that. So being tech savvy is is becoming a essential requirement for everyday life. It's not a luxury. It's not something that you should do for your research. I think everyone should should know it. They should know how to code. They should know how to write and how to communicate. And specifically for our discipline, it's very important, as we've seen throughout this pandemic, um, examples of very good communicators of people who take very complicated research and are able to transmit the gist of all of that to all of us who might not understand the, the, the nuts and bolts of it. And so I think this is what I would what I would suggest to all of them. And I think a little bit of a note for 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 being not so hard on themselves. Sometimes our graduate students, um, you know, they're competitive and they're ambitious and and they want to do great and they want to do a lot of stuff and 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 sometimes you have to be mindful that you know you have periods in your life when you need a bit of a slowdown or where your emotional and psychological impacts come into play and and they tap you on the shoulder and they want you to pay attention so so that's okay too and i think it's very important that you open up to your advisor about this, to to counseling if that's needed, to your family, you know, don't be isolated. Try and talk about it. We're all humans. We all know, you know, all of these things uh, might have gone through them. So so I think um, yeah, I think they should have plans. <laughs> they should have backup plans. Um, they should feel confident. It's an interesting world. We had some hiccups these this past two, almost two years, but we're getting we're learning to go through them. I think we're learning important lessons for the future and how to handle maybe similar situations. Uh, I, and I think, yeah, I think they should be wildly interdisciplinary and, and they should try and apply their skills widely. 
Excellent. That's Thank it. you. Good, good advice. Uh, particularly, uh, you know, I'm biased here when I say this, but the interdisciplinary side of it, absolutely, I completely agree. Um, Ed, did you want to add any thoughts to that? Yes, uh, it's good you asked that because I agree 100% with, with what Monica said. What my always my approach has been make my own skills as good as I can get, but I make sure that I talk to others to see, OK, I don't know how to do that, but I could use that expertise in a particular application. So going forward, um, you know, it's really important to be able to call on your friends and colleagues and so on to be able to make sure that you've covered all the bases needed to be able to both legitimately do something, but even just as simple as, and well, it's not simple, but even just to attract the funding from whether you're in the consulting world or whether you're in the university environment, you have to have funds available and you know there's no way I'm, I'm a risk assessment person i have applied it always to water resources but i could recognize oh this COVID is frightening as can be i got to do something about that and so i could see how i could do things but a lot of expertise i didn't have so that's when i went to nicole went to others at the university and so on to make sure that we had all of the bases needed to be able to make a strong proposal to NSERC in this case. But in general, that's always my strategy. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Nicole, how about you um, from from your side of things being at Stantec? What are what are some of your some of your thoughts for early career researchers or entrepreneurs at that uh, as well? Sure. Um, I mean, we do have our fair amount of co-op students that we have come through. Um, some are grad students as well and interns. Um, and I think the best characteristic that I see, um, you know, building on what Ed said is those who ask lots of questions. I get really nervous if we've described a procedure at the bench or, you know, in terms of a project and they say, OK, <laughs> and there's no follow up questions. So, um, you know, thinking about it doesn't it's OK to ask any question. You know what I mean? Don't be afraid to feel like um, you should know everything about something on your first day. I think it's great to, you know, even say, you know, I feel like maybe I should know this, but can you remind me how this might work or something like that? Um, it can save you in the end. Um, and something that helped me a lot, I feel like in my work, there is a lot of writing that's involved. I read a lot of proposals, reports, um, and I didn't become a good writer on my own. I remember my first, I guess, grad student paper in a grad course in my master's, my supervisor just completely tore it apart and she did it in the best way. <laughs> she provided me with constructive feedback and how to rephrase those statements and I went and rewrote that. And then I went and worked for the Canadian Water Network and wrote a report for them and my boss ripped apart my first report. <laughs> and that was just the most, effective way for me to become a better writer and same thing came to Stantec, wrote a 10 page letter and they said, when did you write 10 pages? This should be one page and just helped me <laughs> write for all the different contexts that I now work in. So so definitely ask for feedback, take it um, in terms of constructive feedback and work to improve your writing would be another suggestion that I have. Excellent. I, I, I agree with that one as well, because I'm just thinking back to when I was a student and first started writing. Pfft, terrible. <laughs> um, OK, and we'll uh, now move to Rosita for for your comments in terms of uh, advice for early career researchers or entrepreneurs. Sure, absolutely. Uh, first of all, uh, I will keep it short because everybody, Monica, uh, Ed, uh, Nicole, they have had uh, great advice. I completely agree with uh, Ed and Nicole, uh, Monica about interdisciplinary and you as well, Dan. Uh, I think that's the future, whether they come to academia or they stay in a job force. Uh, but they have to be have interdisciplinary skills and also be able be ready to always learn new stuff, because I think that would be the future that the, maybe the job uh, landscape will change constantly and they should be take this certificate and, you know, so up their skills with new technology or um, or topics, so combining law and technology, public policy and technology, just name it. I think the future is very one health and technology. 
it will be quite uh, interdisciplinary. Uh, if they want to stay in academia, I have a feeling that, uh, especially with pandemic, uh, it was going on that direction. I think academia may go undergo some changes in terms of course delivery and those things in the next 10 years. Uh, so they have to make sure that that's something they like. <clears throat> and um, uh, yeah, so uh, and I uh, so I think they should be the opportunities are enormous. I guess it, combining technology with new applications. Just look at agriculture, healthcare. I, it's just quite fascinating. And it, even with policy and procedures, now we are bringing policy to the algorithm level in terms of interpretability of uh, data analysis so that the user, when they come to you and ask about how you made that decision about me, you, you would be able to explain. So now policy procedures are coming down to the technology itself. And that makes it uh, very interesting and uh, very challenging at the same time. So, so I think interdisciplinary skills are quite uh, impactful, uh, knowing technology and 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 a certain topic. Um, uh, yeah, I guess that's everybody covered all the all the the import, important stuff. But if they come to academia, they I have worked in industry, I have worked in government, information privacy commission's office, BlackBerry. Academia is a very different environment. It's quite demanding. Time may be flexible to some extent if you want to have a family, but it's absolutely demanding in a different way. So uh, if you are making yourself ready for academia, you have to have a checklist in terms of publication, references, you know, so you have to have everything covered and also think about how your futures uh, will change when you come to academia in terms of having family and you know, your career. Uh, it's it's a very different from other uh, kind of uh, work environment. Yeah, okay, thanks. Excellent, thanks Rosita. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's definitely a, a different beast, but uh, I, it's it, it can be a lot of fun. So, uh, you know, if, if it is uh, sort of where you want to go, definitely, you know, talk to some of the your advisors um, to sort of get a better picture of what they've gone through, uh, their experience, uh, the challenges that they face, so you can get a better sense of whether or not uh, academia is where you want to be. Um, we need a lot of a lot of great brains in academia and in industry to help solve a lot of these big problems. And one of the really cool thing, and we heard this throughout the conversations uh, today, is that a lot of the work that's going on, it, it is interdisciplinary. It requires collaboration, not just with academics and external researchers, but with community partners, with um, expertise that's not necessarily academic, um, and bringing all of that together to, to sort of address a, a major problem such as what the COVID-19 pandemic has been, um, you know, it's it's absolutely necessary in order to solve the challenges that we face. And so I do, I completely agree. I think that interdisciplinary thing is, is the future. So we're at 11.45, so uh, that's as long as we're supposed to go. We didn't get a chance to get into audience questions. I don't know if any have been submitted as of yet, um, but uh, I don't want to sort of drag this on uh, longer than we need to because I believe there is other stuff coming after this. Um, so I do want to extend a thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, it was a great conversation. I, I learned a lot um, and it was great because I did, as I said, I don't always get to hear what other colleagues are doing, so it's kind of fun to hear that um, from my perspective. Um, also want to thank uh, Carrie Ann and Nick and everybody that has helped organize uh, this uh, session. Uh, I think it was really fruitful and hopefully for the grad students who are here, you, you got a lot of good information out of this. Feel free to reach out to us though if you do have any further questions. I'm sure everybody that was on the panel would be happy to address any questions after the fact uh, if, if you have any. Um, and with that uh, and with all the thank yous out there, I'd like to now pass it back to Leonid. Um, for the next step. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, uh, I want to thank, I want to second you to uh, by thanking all the panelists. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dan, Monica, Ed, Rosita, uh, and Nicole. Um, I also want to thank all the presenters. Uh, uh, of the research uh, in the previous uh, section of, of this event, and I want to thank all everyone who attended and listened, and hopefully uh, learned uh, a lot of the exciting stuff. Uh, and of course, I want to thank our organizers, uh, Karen, Nick, and uh, anyone else who helped them. 
So with this, um, now the drum roll, we, we are going to announce the, the winners uh, of the awards for best present, uh, student presentation. Uh, as uh, was mentioned, uh, we had uh, many excellent presentations. Uh, I was um, really excited to see this very wide scope of research we have and a lot of interdisciplinary research. It sounds uh, very exciting and very promising um, for uh, building uh, collaborations uh, uh, in academia and industry, and also it sounds very promising for the careers of our graduate students. Um, so I will announce the winners of um, the, uh, the awards. Uh, first place uh, comes with $500 prize, and it goes to Suranjoy Singh Singha. Congratulations. The second place will receive $250 prize, and is awarded to Rohini Gaikar. Uh, the judges also wanted to give honorable mention to three, uh, the following three presenters. Ni Tang, Samantha Binkley, and Abdullah al -Hayali. Congratulations to everybody. Congratulations to, win to the winners and uh, honorable mentions. And uh, big thanks to everyone who uh, invested their time in preparing these presentations. Uh, I, I sincerely believe these exercises are very important, very useful for uh, development of graduate skills and careers of our graduate students. So with this, I want to thank everyone again, all the participants, presenters, panelists, and organizers. And uh, hopefully next year we will meet face to face. So thank you again and have a great day. Thank you everyone and thank you Dan for moderating.